Right. I think everyone's joining us now. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, Game Public event, uh, running a games business, uh, kindly sponsored by Barclays. Um, in around uh, 10 minutes, we'll have uh, a panel discussion on uh, all aspects of uh, running a games business with our uh, industry guests, uh, some fantastic guests. Um, first up, we have uh, an update on the video games tax relief uh, cultural test from Anna Mansi at the BFI. So over to you, Anna. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining and thanks to Jamie for having us. Um, I'm going to do a very, very quick rundown on the video games tax relief. So I'm just going to share the screen and hopefully this will work just to give you a, present, a very short presentation. Oh. It's saying you've disabled screen sharing, Jamie. Oh, there yeah, we go. See, yesterday. it's all going well, isn't it? We did there a test are, run panelists. yesterday, I promise. Yeah, there we are. Okay. I'll mute myself now so you'll come up. Okay. Uh, is that looking okay, Jamie? Yeah, all good. Brilliant. Okay, so uh, just to introduce myself, uh, I'm Anna Mansi, I'm head of the certification unit at the British Film Institute. And we are responsible for processing um, applications for film, television and video games tax relief. And we've been doing the video games tax relief for five years since it was introduced. Uh, actually, six years now since it was introduced. And we do a lot of um, talks on how you can qualify just to sort of dispel a few myths about what it what it's about and, and how, how you can actually access the tax relief. So I'm going to go straight in because I haven't got much time. First of all, I want to just kick off with a few misconceptions about the tax relief. Um, I think there's a lot of myths about you have to have the Union Jack flag or a phone box in your game, but that's not the case at all. Even if you, you, you're creating a game, you're setting it in America, it will probably qualify for the culture test. And we, even if you're not sure when you run through the points that your game will qualify, we'd always suggest that you get in touch with us. Um, my, my contact details are on the slides and I'm happy for Jamie to share them or you can just email us at certifications at bfi.org.uk um, and we're always available to have a chat and guide you through it. Um, so another one is nar only narrative games can pass culture chess. That's not the case. Any type of game, as long as they're interactive, it's interactive, as long as it's intended for supply to the public. Um, and that's one of the criteria I'll come on to in a moment. Uh, as long as it's a, a it's a game um, and we're seeing a lot of stuff now is sort of film and interactive as long as those are interactive choices that could qualify as well and if it doesn't qualify under games tax relief it might qualify under the film tax relief um, it's not limited to certain platforms any type of platform um, i've seen games on web browsers mobile pc every kind of platform you can think of it will qualify um, it's not only for large budget games, it's for all sizes of budget. I have budgets of 4,000 up and, and we have budgets in, you know, in the millions as well. So any, any budget size is able to access the tax relief. Uh, the process may require an accountant. Um, you, if when you get to the final application stage, you need to claim certain points in section C and D, you may need to get an accountant to verify that verify those points but it, it's not essential um, and usually if we can get you to qualify for the 16 points that you need in sections A and B we'll steer you down that path but we'll always give you the easiest route possible. Um, you don't have to have a publisher attached um, if you, you can uh, supply your game yourself. Um, sometimes if you've got going into a contract with a publisher maybe that they may want to claim the tax relief so it's always good to have to negotiate if they bring that up in a contract about who's going to claim the tax relief if they are going to claim the tax relief they must make sure that they are the video games development company um, and you don't have to own the ip for the game but again this could be if you've got to deal with the publisher make sure you negotiate uh in those areas in the legislation around tax relief um we will we don't have anything about the ip but it could be it, when you're in negotiation, something to think about. So why should you apply? Well, basically the government is encouraging games companies and film and TV companies to access the tax relief and, and give you money back to make your games in the UK adds value to the economy and our cultural um, heritage. So it's essentially free money for the government to help you make your game. 
whilst you can't get it in advance you can get it during development so if you do six months worth of work you've got an interim cultural test certificate from us and you've got another six months to go perhaps you can claim on that six months up into that point if that's helpful um, you can claim 25 percent of the core expenditure up to a maximum of 80 percent as long as that's core expenditure is, is spent in the UK or EEA um, and core expenditure is basically everything you're paying for to make the game so if paying for your programmers paying for equipment that you need to make the game it's probably the majority of your budget a couple of things that you uh, what we call non-core things like debugging unless you're actually adding content at the debugging stage, so you may be able to add that in but there's not a huge list of things that you can't claim on a basic example of how much you would get back on a £100,000 total budget is 20000 because it's at a rate of 25%. The maximum you can claim on is the 80%, so that would be 80000 as as in the example. So you'd get up to 20000 back. Um, although you can't claim it in advance, I said you can, you can claim it during development, there are financiers and banks, a lot of them around now, uh, who are uh, cash flowing in advance against the, the VGTR. I think Barclays, who might be sponsoring this, they may be doing loans against it, and there are other lenders out there as well. Um, so it's worth looking into that. You might not get the full amount, majority of it, but it does, that can help you if you need to sort of a little bit of finance to get you going at the early stage. So the qualifying criteria, the most important thing is you have to have a games development company set up before full development begins and when, what I mean by full development is before you actually start um, and that company has to be responsible throughout till the game is complete. We know sometimes you might be doing prototyping and then you set up a company that's absolutely fine and if you're concerned that you know you were still in the prototyping stage you weren't sure if you're going to go into full development just give us a call and we'll, we'll check that through with you we, we've had that a couple of times and it's like it's been absolutely fine we understand it's prototyping stage um, you have to spend at least 25 percent of your core expenditure in the uk or the eea this is the only tax relief that we deal with that allows eea expenditure as well i imagine if you're quite a small indie you'll probably be doing it all in the uk so that's fine but if you wanted to outsource maybe some work to uh, another company in france as long as that money runs through um the, as long as it's outsourced and the, the, the contract runs through the um, UK company that's absolutely fine and you'd get tax relief on it as well. Game has to be intended for supply that just means you have to be making the game that is available to be purchased uh, or it can be free to play by the public it's not just something you're doing for friends for example but and that can be as I say on various platforms. You have to qualify as British through the cultural test which is what we do and but as I say I'll, I'll, I'll do a very quick run through and very happy to talk to anyone that wants to go through the test in more detail and, and there's no commitment but we're very much there to help you um, and is it a game it as I said before it just has it has to be clear that it is a game um, that there's interactive choices that you're making we're seeing a lot of different things these days that have a lot of narrative film type elements in it as long as you are making choices that could that can potentially qualify but again just always give us a bell if you're not sure so oh, okay sorry i think i've got a slight delay on my um laptop so just an overview of the cultural test you sorry about this uh it's a 31 point test you only need 16 points to pass and it's broken down into those four sections um, cultural content contribution cultural hubs and cultural practitioners as you can see potentially you can pass the test in cultural content alone in the 16 points and if you can get the points in a and b we'll we'll encourage you to go down that route cultural content is about what you're seeing on screen characters story or underlying material and then language and language even if you don't have any dialogue it includes all text-based instructions setting can be british european or undetermined so if you've got a game that's set in space or just an unspecified generic jungle or landscape that would be fine the same for characters british european or undetermined story it's either a british or european story or the underlying material is by a british or european citizen or resident um, so it's quite wide and accessible. 
if you're making puzzle game, we will look at it in a slightly different uh, way. It doesn't have to be narrative. Um, if you have a racing game or some sort of team sports based game, we may look at it and break it down into nationality of the cars or the, the teams in that kind of respect. So we'll always sort of like look at it in the broadest way possible. Uh, cultural uh, section B is about uh, cultural contribution and you can get up to four points in one of in three categories two per category is the maximum British creativity are you doing something new or unique that you've not seen before um, in a game British heritage is it does your game represent British cultural heritage either through the on-screen content or the underlying material um, we just have to have it some sort of direct connection and then diversity isn't limited to being British and that could be either on screen in the content of your game or the people that are making the game and we look at the unprotected, we look at all the protected characteristics as in legislation. Um, individuals that are underrepresented in, in key roles. So it's quite wide and accessible. Again, if you need to what we're looking for here, we're happy to help you guide you through that. Uh, Section C is quite straightforward. You can get up to three points maximum. You get two points if at least 50% of one of those four categories on screen is, uh, takes place in the UK. And again, two, uh, one point if at least 50% of one of the categories in C2 takes place in the UK. So it's quite wide. Again, this is, this is the case where if you have to do final certification, you have to claim points in C and D, you will need to get an accountant's report. But again, we'll, we'll steer you which way to go and then the last category oh, is cultural practitioners there's eight different categories you get a point for each category on the basis that that person is either a UK citizen uh, the UK or European citizen or resident so if you have a project leader who is American but they live permanently in France then you'd get the point for them and again with small teams where somebody doubles up and rolls say they are the um, project leader and the script writer then you get a point for every category applied so it's quite accessible you know it might be there's just two or three of you and you actually qualify for all those eight positions that's absolutely fine again if you need to claim points in that section with the final application you will need to get an accountant to verify it and they're just verifying the nationality usually they'll ask to see passports or something a copy of a passport just to verify that so that's a very very quick run through i'm just going to very quickly just to explain how you apply we have an online system we generally say four to six weeks turnaround times it may be taking a bit longer at the moment because i have a team of 10 and we've had to furlough every one um but we're doing it on three week rotation just because uh, I've only got five of us on at any one time, but we're we're trying to be as quick as possible. If there's, if you need something, uh, if you need the certificate urgently, just get in touch, and we'll do our best to to try and help you there. As I said, if you want to get interim certification, you can apply for that at any time during development. If you're getting a loan against the games tax review, you, you may find that lender wants to see the interim certificate at the pre-development early stage, so you can do apply then. But as, you can apply at any time but you will need to have that certificate if you want to claim um, during development as you incur expenditure if you're fully financed and you just want to wait till the end you can just go for the final certificate if you do, you ha everyone has to do a final certificate so if you've done interim you'll need to do final as well and you do that once the game's complete and it's ready to be um, put out on a platform uh, and, and to be sold or, or whether free to play we have got guidance notes, they are quite extensive, but if you're not sure about anything, these are all our own website, just give us a call. Um, as it says there, fill out only the relevant sections. What we mean by this is you only need the 60 point, 16 points, you don't need to get to 31 and we'll uncut, we can guide you through that as we said before. We ask for a few supporting documents, a budget if you have it, um, or a final cost report if it's a final application, a schedule, game design documents, scripts, visuals, copy of the game, and that can depend on um, if it's a final application, then we'd ask for a copy of the game or a link. Um, if it's an interim application, it's some sort of document, just so we can verify points that you might be claiming in terms of visuals, or even if you've got a, a short video of, the, of, of 
a prototype, that kind of thing. That's really helpful too. We do have templates of budgets and schedules. If you don't have that kind of documentation, that's on our website. Um, we ask for an underlying material declaration if you need to claim points for section A3B. And then finally, you may need an accountant's report, as I've said, in terms of section C and D. Gen usually we ask for a statutory declaration that has to be witnessed and with a hard copy of the application form. As no one can do that at the moment, we put in place a system as soon as we went into lockdown that you can, you just need to do an electronic application and you can do the statutory declaration hard copy form uh, within six months of um, the certificate being issued. But uh, and we'll follow follow that up with you. Hopefully, we will be back into the office within six months. And that's it. Uh, I think I went a tiny bit over. Sorry, Jamie. Yeah, no worries. Thank you, Anna. That's uh, that's great. Thank you. Um, if you could just close down the, the screen, that'd be brilliant. Yeah. Um, fantastic. Yes, as you mentioned, um, this mm. event is uh, kindly sponsored by uh, Barclays, and they um, they do have a scheme to claim your video game tax relief uh, up front so if you want to um uh, look into that i can certainly um put you in touch with the right people there uh, also um good timing because um this week just our newest uh, game public member is uh, an accountancy firm creative tax reliefs and they're based in the north in uh, sunny bolton and uh, they are x uh, hmrc uh, tax credit, uh, R&D tax credit and VGTR specialists. Um, so they're getting public members if you need any help with um, accountancy and working on your tax relief. So I just want a friendly free chat to them. Uh, you can chat to uh, Graham Suggett. Uh, his email is in the um, email that I sent out to the network on Tuesday. Uh, if you don't have that, um, just uh, let me know and I, I can uh, put you in touch. Uh, yeah, thanks I don't... again, Anna. Thank you. I don't normally recommend people, but obviously Graeme is at HMRC and he's a really good guy. So Yeah, knows his, absolutely knows his stuff. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. All right, thanks again, Anna. That's great. Are you going to hang around and uh, Yeah, and I will. I will see, yeah. Good stuff. Thanks very much. Excellent. No Bye, worries. Uh, great. Right. Okay. So um, we're going to crack on now with our panel and uh, I think everyone is going to um, unmute themselves and show their videos. Uh, this panel is going to be uh, running a games business. If you think of any questions that um, you might want to ask the panel, um, please sort of pop them into the Q&A bit uh, below and um, we'll ask those at the end of the, um, of the panel. Um, or if they're relevant, I'll, I'll bring them in. But um, hello, panellists. <laughs> Hello, uh, we've got uh, Victoria Hollings, uh, ex PopCap, and now at uh, Boom Dash uh, Digital. And we have Casper Fields, ex uh, Wish Studios, uh, now at Talk Management, as you can see in the background there. Very good. On brand and everything, very good. Uh, and uh, David Clark, uh, uh, Green Man Gaming, I think you still do stuff for them, and Cuba Entertainment as well. Okay. Um, so uh, I'd quickly like to um, start by asking uh, Vic, um, if you'd just like to sort of quickly um, say a bit about yourself <laughs> and your experience of actually running uh, a games business. Okay, well, hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Um, so I, um, I've been running my own studio for the last few years um, and we've managed to, um, I came more from a mobile background. So what we did, we uh, delved into our, our mobile and standalone. So we launched Evil Dead and that was a very small um, game studio. So it was a, a mostly remote as well. So it was funded by Screen Northern Ireland. Um, so we had a team in Belfast, so I had to manage that. So some, you know, pointers maybe later on, on remote studios mm. um, and previous to that I worked um, for a large company I worked for PopCap Games um, over in Dublin and we were the mobile team for the whole of the company so um, that was interesting I you know I had more like 60-ish people there um, and we took up two to three games at a time and first of all we worked as a mobile specialist um, company in Dublin for PopCap and then we moved to a franchise model when EA took over us. So mm. that was, that's a different set of um, planning and working out. So it's, it's kind of like, mm. it's different experience. So I've, I've worked with big teams and franchise models or specialization models. And then I've worked with smaller teams and remote teams uh, more recently. My, that's, that's my experience. In, in 
yeah good stuff um david um what about yourself okay so uh hello everyone dave clark um i um unlike uh, victoria and casper here uh, i come up purely through the publishing side i've not uh, run a dev studio but um i kind of got into the publishing side of video games kind of way back in 1992 first game i ever worked on was sonic the hedgehog 2 for the sega mega drive that date <laughs> um and um so i've kind of done the sort of like come up through the marketing side sales side business development side started my own um business cuba entertainment 12 years ago um sort of doing biz dev marketing uh, solutions for studios and publishers during that time founding director of green man gaming most uh, most people know green man as a retailer of video games keys. But two and a half years ago, they set up a, um, a, a publishing arm and got me in to run that for two and a half years, uh, which I, that, that ran its course, finished in November. And now I just do a couple of days a week for them helping out on the biz dev side. Um, so, so my experience in, all of, in terms of running you know uh companies in the games industry i guess is is kind of the green man gaming side yeah good stuff brilliant and casper hello hello uh so yeah i uh i started out in the industry not quite as far back as dave but in 97 as a journalist writing for edge magazine and uh so um I, I, then in 2000 i switched over to work in development and uh, worked at a bunch of different places in development and publishing, including a brief stint at SCI with Dave. Yep. And, uh, and then in 2012, I started a company called Wish Studios with two colleagues. And we grew that to 35 people. And we were making uh, what became known as Playlink for PlayStation. And so uh, we ran that for seven years. Yeah. And then after about a year and a half at the end trying to get a new deal, we couldn't get anything landed. So we had to wind it up about a year or so ago. And then since then, apart from just sorting out the remains of Wish, I've been getting started doing consultancy, which is talk management. And I'm helping, uh, tends to be kind of indie developers with things like uh, production, operations, budgeting, deal terms, that kind of stuff. All yeah. the stuff that I learned from being a, a CEO of a dev studio for seven years. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. So uh, a lot of experience um, we're hearing there. So, um, I mean, what, what for all of you is the kind of biggest challenge when running a games business? Uh, well, I find that it's, it's, it's talent. It's finding the right people. Um, mm. it, it's, it's difficult because, you know, it, it, it's all about people. If you don't have the right people in your team, if they don't fit culturally, because sometimes you can find someone with an amazing CV as well, mm. and then you might bring them in and get them to talk to the team and they're just not going to fit. You know, something some, might go the other way around, that would be great fit, but the CV is not quite up to scratch, but you can always <laughs> try. Yeah. So, uh, it's, it's, it's good. Uh, it, it, I think that it's very important to me. That, that's the thing I find that talent is key and it is hard to, to root them out sometimes. Mm. Yeah. What about, what about you, Cass? Was, was, um, was that an issue? Because you were based in Brighton, weren't you? So. Yeah, well, Brighton, Brighton uh, obviously, it's got quite a big dev scene, but uh, as it got bigger and better, that presented different problems where we had a lot of multinationals buy up studios. So... We ended up with uh, Boss Alien owned by Zinger and mm. TT Games opened a mobile studio here. And then obviously Unity, it's got its HQ here. Um, Electric Square and Studio Goba are both really big. And so, although there's a great, amazing talent pool down here, there's also a lot of competition over wages and that presents a lot of problems for an indie studio. Mm. Because you just can't compete with what people have got to offer. Mm. Um, so then that falls back on having a great culture and a great team spirit. And that's really where, you know, I, we're probably going to talk about that in a bit. I think that's one of the challenges right now, obviously in lockdown is that one of the great strengths of being an indie studio is that you have that strong team culture and that closeness and that involvement in everything that's going on and maintaining that in a lockdown is really tricky. Mm. Um, yeah, definitely. Dave, Dave, what about you? Um, well, I mean, 
I, I totally agree with uh, what the others have said, but I'd add to that uh, time. I think time mm. is the biggest challenge because time is money. And, you know, if you've got all the time in the world where well, you don't need to worry about so much about staff because, you know, the you know, resource only becomes an issue if you're trying to, 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 to squeeze a large project into a shorter period of time. Um, if you've got all the time in the world, you don't need to worry about that. And, and if you've got all the time in the world, you don't necessarily have to worry so much about budgets and you don't mm. have to worry about outs and, and, and all the other things and, and release dates. Um, you know, gosh, you know, release dates compress everything and you always get that mad sort of moments, six hours from launch where you're trying to do everything, squeeze six years worth of work into six hours you know, um, that crunch period. So, so for, for me, I'd, I'd add time is the biggest mm. thing. It, it's, it, you know, and, and, and other bits and pieces as well is that, you know, from a publishing background, one of the challenges that I see, particularly on the indie side, is that development processes tend to be very linear. You do A, you go on to B, and then at the end, when you finish development, then they start thinking about, um, uh, you know, bringing the game to market. Well, by that time, it's too late. You know, you need to have started that process six, 12 months earlier, maybe even longer in some cases. Um, so, so, you know, all these different factors, in my mind, all come back to time. Yeah, yeah, no, that's interesting. Um, I mean, um, yeah, I think, I think uh, you touched upon it there, Cass. Um, you know, the elephant in the room is obviously this, this pandemic and the difficulties of, of, of um, studios working uh, remotely and working from home and you know how do you keep that kind of company culture and, and stuff going I mean uh, Vic you know how what have you been doing to kind of um, you know keep the, the company um, you know going in this in this situation and what's what have been the, the main challenges would you say? Um, it, it's just <laughs> Well, your communication. So, how how are you going to manage your team? So, you because you know, communication is always important in you know in any project you're doing. So, and in any culture, you know, trying to keep that alive. So, it's what is working for your team. You know, is are they all up to doing? Do they want to do Zoom meetings? Do they want to use Trello? All these things. You know, do they want to be seen all day on a camera? You know, or do they feel intimidated? And I think it's up to you as a as, as a business owner to work out what makes your team happy and try mm. it and be afraid to try something and if it's not working try something else because you know we're all in individuals so and we're putting a group of people together you've got to make sure that those people are, are gelling and they can use and, and the thing that you're using is is good for that team dynamic not just works for you and you want to say right you must use this and use that i, I think you've got to just be aware that people think differently and act differently and respond differently so it's a it's up to you to find out how they best respond. So I think it's just to keep yeah. that communication going and, and, and sending them nice presents with posts. I've seen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I saw somebody today on Facebook getting a nice, um, a nice kind of uh, um, package from, from their work, you know, kind yeah. of um, emergency <laughs> package full of chocolate and crisps and things. I, th I thought that was a lovely thing. And, and it's kind of, uh, it just shows that the company's kind of thinking about them really. And um, I mean, what about you? Casper, yeah, you know what sort of you know. that's that's important so yeah yeah definitely yeah i think um something i used to make a point of at wish was spending time going around looking at what people were actually doing at their desks and talking to them about it and paying attention and i think mm. finding a way to do that remotely is really important you know because that's mm. what people really want to know they want to know that you care about what they're doing and you, they want to show you they're doing a good job usually mm. so finding a way to do that and get involved and and give real feedback on on their work and not just leave them kind of sat in a box you know even then i think gifts is an amazing thing to do and we used to have so much uh, good feedback for things like that at wish but i think mm. it's ultimately people want to know that you care about their work and, mm. and paying attention to them and i hear i've heard so many stories in lockdown of people that are really suffering with that you know, people that are, um, well, my sister-in-law uh, suffers, is really suffering where she's living on her own and mm. her boss has called her like twice in two months or something, you know, and it's like, it's crazy yeah. how people expect people to keep being motivated and keep working with that sort of level mm. of feedback. 
I'm seeing some great invention um, from from our companies up here. Actually, you know, I'm seeing uh, like Sumo, for example. They have um, seems to have like weekly or or actually almost daily. I don't know what's going on at Sumo, but they have uh, pub meetups where they all kind of get together on Zoom and and dress up and have and have fun and stuff. And I think that that sort of stuff is is important for um, that kind of keeping that company culture going. I mean, you know, that that would be quite difficult, I imagine. Um, you know, transferring that kind of office, you know, vibe where you've got everyone chatting to each other and those little moments of magic where things, you know, happen between people. And then, you know, now it's kind of, it's more difficult to make that happen. It's some kind of virtual water cooler. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, I think that's the thing that, um, you know, I, I, I ran a, um, a virtual event the other week and, um, you know, the meetings and things all went fine. It's those kind of, serendipitous little accident things that happen at conferences that, that we're missing out on those little moments out with before you get into a, a conference yeah. talk or just bumping into someone at a bar and all that kind of stuff that's more difficult I think to to recreate in digitally and I think I imagine that at companies that it's those little moments that are more difficult to, to recreate. And certainly from my side that point you you, you raised there about the um, you know the, the, the bumping into people um, is is exactly the point I was going to 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 raise. I mean, again, I I you know I come at this from a, a somewhat different angle, which is you know the publishing side, uh, the, if you like the commercial side. I mean, not, obviously everything we do is commercial, but mm. but from the publishing side, so a slightly different view on this. And um, and what I've seen the upside of. Of, of everything that's going on in the world is that the video games industry has enjoyed a tremendous COVID bounce. Mm. Uh, you just look at all the numbers that people are pumping out and they're through the roof. And, and what that's shown to me is what the true potential of the video games industry is, you know, um, and, and where it can truly go to. Um, and, and the problem as I saw, the challenge as I see is, is, is how do you maintain that? Or are we just mm. going to slip back to where we once were, you know, sort of back in January, December time. And, um, and, and all, you know, the video games industry for all its innovation and, and, and adopting of new technology is actually very conservative. I, I find with, um, um, with on um, sort of like this business development side this 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 kind of like grasping uh, new commercial opportunities and 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 um and, and using those to grow your business and you know and, and and what used to happen is you'd go to i don't know you go to gamescom or you go to develop down in brighton mm. and you bump into somebody at the bar you get talking to them or you're introduced by a friend who's used somebody else and that's how business development was done well, of course, that's all now gone and you don't have that. And so, so you know, hence why I worry that this sort of COVID bounce is going to kind of dis uh, dissipate into nothing. Mm. So and, and so to my mind, you know, that's that's a huge challenge that we've got. And I think it's going to there's got to have to be a, a, a mindset change for people to to adopt or be be more open to to business development and to to growth opportunities and to and to finding new ways to bring your product to market being slightly more adventurous as to who you're willing to talk to uh, outside mm. of your network of, sort of trusted friends and advisors um so so it's how do we and before we got onto this call the conversation was when's the next trade show going to be well quite frankly i can't see it being this year not a live one um and and in which case i mean that's that's 12 months for a lot of companies to go without without that networking then that that those growth opportunities and that could be quite damaging for a lot of companies yeah yeah i mean uh, vic you know how, how are you going to um you know develop your your business at, at boom dash and things what are the things that you're doing um you know to kind of get over that um, well, yeah, it, it's like Dave said, it's, it, it's tough because there's usually events you go to, you, know, you get out and about, you go to the bar, you, you know, you, you have those serendipitous conversations and it, it's, it's a struggle. I mean, I think I'm hoping that 
at the moment necessity is the mother of invention and mm. you know like we're doing here you know we're not stopping your events so you know we're, we're finding a way here and like i say some companies are doing the virtual pub things so it's you know i think we'll all we'll have to we'll have to work out a different way won't we we need to find out how mm. we're going to bring that element back in um it's we've not done it yet um but mm. so i'm happily looking out for those opportunities so yeah <laughs> well actually there's um uh, gamesindustry.biz um uh, did a story today about something that's been happening for the last couple of weeks on uh, i think it's on facebook but it's basically a a um, couple of hundred industry people get together and then they're put in kind of random rooms where they all get a chance to kind of, you know, chat and meet new people. And it's quite a nice idea that it's kind of the equivalent of being at the W, I suppose, at like GDC or somewhere where you, you're just in a, a place where you just meet lots of different people. And I think that's that's kind of a nice way of doing things. But um, yes, um, emerge like that, that, you know, because we will, you know, we, it, could, it could be another six months, as Dave said, until we, we get out and about. So, mm. You know, we, we, the industry will find a way. We, we will find a way, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, just to move on to kind of um, uh, more sort of general kind of stuff about running a company and um, things like project management. This is something that I hear quite a lot from, from companies. And it's something I think for new uh, games companies that they find you know, quite difficult on managing projects and, and exactly that thing that, uh, Dave, you were talking about, about time and managing that time. So do you have any tips on on kind of what, what companies can do to make sure that they kind of, um, they, they manage the project correctly and the kind of tools that they can use. Uh, Cass, well, you want to start with yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, number one in all of it, I think is communication. You know, I think so much you see teams have meetings well, before lockdown anyway, you'd, you'd have a lot of meetings going on where the wrong people were in the, in the, meeting talking about features and ideas for games and things and too often it'd be kind of like the top level of people on a team will try and solve it all themselves rather than involving everyone mm. so there i think also like there are a lot of simple tools like daily stand-ups and things that people can do and they can do that on zoom and they are i know mm. uh, and just making sure people are, are talking about the detail of what they've got to do each day and, and seeing if they can help each other through it I think on a on a bigger level, on a higher level, I think one of the biggest things I see is that teams struggle with scope and they overscope projects all the time, all the time, and they just literally are doing it to themselves and digging themselves a massive hole that they've then got to climb back out of. And I think, and it's not only about the creation of content, but it's about the polishing, bug fixing, and and completion of content so you can ship it. I think that's where teams often underestimate how much work they've got to get done to get a game made. And mm. usually you have some horrific moments sometime kind of around beta probably where reality really starts to sink in for people and how much they've mm. got finished to actually get the game out. And, and so, yeah, that'd be my top tip to anyone is really be hard on the scope of your game and be sure about what it is that you're putting in there and why you're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Vic, yeah. What about yourself? What sort of, um, yeah. I mean, I, I echo that completely. I mean, it, uh, and also it's it's about sometimes the horse has bolted because you've got to be realistic at the start. If you don't start with realistic milestones and you kind of plan that it's okay, well, you know, we can crunch, we can crunch. You know, you're, mm. if some teams do start like that, they plan, oh, we can crunch, it's okay. That's people are used to it. That's what we do in this business. So, you know, it's if you're already playing to crunch before you even started, you're onto a loser. So, yeah. you know, you've, you have to be, if, if you can be, if you've not started the project, be absolutely realistic of what, what you can achieve in the time you have for the people and resource, not, not like don't rely on crunching at all, because you will have to, mm. but you know, that, that's when it goes wayward and because of feature creep, as, as Casper mentioned, yeah. and, and that's the other thing, you must, it's good to have a very strong producer, but the, the producer must know their role and their role is to make sure they're doing anything that the team needs for, for them to do their job properly and to keep them on track. It's your job to keep them on track and not let them feature creep. So you've got to be very diplomatic as well um, about, you know, what can and can't be done. And, uh, and I think the, the other thing is delegation. So not letting mm. those, those top people in that, in, in that group think that they can do everything. You've got to trust the team. You've got to show the team you've got their trust. And, and and then you're not trying to do everything yourself and then suddenly throwing it all at the team at the end when it can't be done. So 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, Dave, <laughs> Dave, when you know, like in um, you know, when you talk about sort of the hedgehog days and things, right from the nineties, and you know, crunch. When I got into the industry in sort of late nineties as well, you know, crunch was just part of the industry. It was just something that 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 you did. Uh, and it's 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 interesting, and it's it's good. I think nowadays that people are talking about that, and the the fact that you know mental health is an issue uh, in the games industry that we that we do talk about now, which you know we never used to do twenty years ago. Um, so is 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 this something that that companies and people have to be aware of now, and have to be you know to, to try and avoid crunch altogether? And I know that companies, a lot of companies in our region, quite you know pride themselves on not having crunch because they they plan properly <laughs> but that's about project management and making sure that like you're saying you don't have feature creep and you don't have um, stuff that comes in that that can you know mean that you have more to do in in less time you know I, so i come in at this from the from from right at the end of the process so you know the other guys you know are deep into the development side and, and everything that project manages from that and and um but but i witness it from you know the the, the publisher side and there's a couple of sort of basic facts that, you know, if you're a first time, well, in fact, any dev, I guess, but particularly for first time devs who are perhaps looking to reach out to publishers, you know, project management is, is one of the things that a publisher will look for. Um, you know, if you're going to a publisher and saying, you know, look, I'd like half a million pounds or a million pounds, please, to help me complete this game. You know, a, a, a publisher is going to want to look after and protect that investment. They're there to take mm -hmm. a gamble. But if they've got two choices between on the one side, a studio that's got no realistic project management in, in, in their proposal whatsoever, and a team that's thought about this on the other side, they're always going to go with the team that's thought through. Or mm -hmm. particularly, of course, if they're a, a well-established uh, studio that have, have, have succeeded and, and, and delivered to a plan time and time again um, because it, it reduces the risk in the eyes of the publisher mm. and, and and again you know why why does feature why, sorry, why, why does crunch happen well crunch from a publisher's side pr probably comes about because again you know so like listen guys I've given you a million pounds I've budgeted for that game to be out on that day, and I don't give a damn. That game is coming out on that day, right? You told me you could do it, damn well deliver it, because it's a million pounds of my money on the table. Uh, and, and, and that's kind of how the problems, problems start. Um, and, and so, you know, the teams that have done what Casper and Victoria talk about, you know, and done it diligently and properly, uh, in a in a way that's kind of outside my my experience and understanding, mm. but they're, they're the guys that have got a a better chance of getting a, a publishing deal that they're wanting for the value of money that um, they're they're looking for. B, they've got a better chance of um, avoiding that that crunch period and everything that goes with that that you've all t uh, touched upon. And and if they're self publishing. You know, if you're a, 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 a you know part of a you know a large development publishing studio, mm. again, it's your own money. So again, it's exactly the same same issues. You know, you avoid mm. that. I suspect anyway, the, the you know the, the feature creep where you've got to avoid the feature creep. You've got to avoid mm. the crunch and the time pressures that come back to it. So that's kind of that's kind of how mm. I do the whole thing. And and that 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 comes on to budgeting actually, which is one of the one of the things I want to come on to which it kind of ties into project management really but um casper what, what in your experience what are the th things that the, the pitfalls that you can fall into for budgeting what are the things you're going to you know that you perhaps don't think about that you need to make sure that you budget when you're making a game i think one of the toughest things at the start is that you're asked to work out a budget for a game but games you know you the days of the GDD, thankfully, are pretty much over where people try and design an entire game up front. But then you're also asked to price up that game when you're not really sure exactly how it's going to turn out. And so naturally, the scope of a game is going to shift around a bit as you make it. Mm. So I think that's quite a tough thing to solve. And some of it just comes with experience. Yeah. Uh, I think the other thing I see a lot is that uh, you get a real battle between quality and budget. And I think a lot of small developers, uh, 
they feel like they've got to put absolutely everything into the game because they want to make sure that their game is going to be the best it can be. Mm. And so they end up like going again, blowing out the scope and they spend too much budget making it to the point where they end up with no profit in the game at all. Mm. And, and that's not to anyone's benefit because you end up with a, a team at the end of the project with nothing in the bank and unable to really support themselves whilst they're waiting for hopefully some royalties or something to come in. And, mm. uh, and so I say to everyone that I, talk, I work with and that I talk to, you know, a big business goal should be to build up a buffer to make a profit on your development. Not an outrageous one, but a reasonable profit. So that you build up a bit of buffer of cash and you can make better business decisions and be in a better position to negotiate your next deal, hopefully, after making your first game. But don't get tempted to blow it all on in the name of quality because you will come to regret it. Yeah. Vic, what about in your experience, you know, with, with budgeting and mobile budgets, which, you know, can be, um, you know, difficult because you have a, an ongoing cost there, some, you know, with, with yeah. games as a service often? Well, actually, on the last one, well, when we did, Evil Dead on VR, I actually forgot the audio costs in there because like right. <laughs> it's mobile, I don't really think about audio that much anymore because it's different to console, you has really in your mind, but like, yeah, I didn't, I didn't pay anything for audio, <laughs> but I wanted it. Um, so yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a contingency, so you must have, you know, it's like, as Casper said, you know, you, you don't know what you don't know until, you, you know, when, you, when your game's kind of, you know, it's not developed, it's not designed, sorry, all up front. So if you can, if you've got that luxury, always try some to leave some contingency in your budget. So when, even if you put something in for audio or localization, because that's something I think people might forget about, costs for translation, especially yeah. if, it's, if it's not a mobile game. Even some mobile games can get quite wordy these days, but you know there, there are all these costs which you, and you might not know but when you're kind of doing your spreadsheets I mean, how much they're going to be so just remember to leave the contingency and um, don't forget your QA localization and audio so <laughs> yeah. um, prepare for the unexpected and if, if you've yeah. got offer brilliant and, and I think on the you know and again if you if you're going to go down the route of a publisher one of the things a, a decent publisher should be doing is, um, you know, giving you feedback on the budget. I mean, a decent publisher should pick up on, for example, QA, localization, those sort of things. Hold on, where's that in the budget? Um, and, um, you know, certification, you know, have you allowed for that? And, mm -hmm. and, and all these sort of various other things. And, um, you know, well, you know, and, and listen, you're, this is coming out on three platforms. Where's, you know, how, how are you budgeting for that? Or, you know, if it's uh, some sort of server-based game, where's the cost for that? So, so a publisher can be part of the solution from that because, again, it, it doesn't serve anybody's benefit if you've seriously under-budgeted. You know, obviously, Casper talks about profit. There is no point in doing it if there's no profit in it. You know, you, you, yes, you might be doing it because it's a vanity project, but uh, maybe for you, but not for the other people you're em employing, you know. Mm. So, you know, you, if you want to carry on making games, there's got to be some profit in it. And, um, and, and if there's, but if there's no profit in it, and if you've forgotten various things, um, and, and they all mount up to significant chunks of money, then the whole project will implode and you'll fall out with your publisher, your game won't be what you want it to do. Again, the kind of the deck of cards rapidly collapses. Mm. Um, so, so hence why a publisher will, will, will want to be part of that solution and will do their best to make sure that you've actually um, catered for everything. And, and in, in the same way as the guys were saying about putting buffer in, a publisher in, should, in their budget, put buffer in as well mm. um i'm just going to say to everyone who, who's watching i'm going to ask maybe uh, one or two more questions and if, if you if you've got any um thing any questions that you want to ask um pop them into the q a bit and i'll ask them um in a couple of minutes um but i was going to ask about um you mentioned about publishers there actually what are the things um vic for example um that you should be aware of when approaching publishers are the things that when you're when you're sorting out contracts and, and stuff that you should be 
looking out for little um you know pitfalls and things that you might not think about that you know through your experience you've learned to make sure you include that in in contracts um i guess going from the so from a developer point of view because cast uh, david doesn't have a, a different um view i'm sure but uh do read the contracts first of all don't just <laughs> them um if you can afford and hopefully you, you should try and get it to a solicitor because you know I, i've read a lot of contracts now and you can you can understand them it, but sometimes the, you know there's there's little bits in there which you, it's if you had a solicitor because you'll be like yeah i'm fine with that but the solicitor is going to tell you exactly what that means and you know there's a, if there's ex exclusivity in there you know the, the you want to know what you're getting for that you know how long you're tied for what does that actually mean you know because you might be you might assume things mm. it's, it's probably you don't assume so you might say exclusive for six months you go oh, brilliant six months yeah i can do that they're going to give me this for it but then there might be some little bit a clause later on that explains that six months and then they'll have a runoff period of so many two months or something so don't um even if it seemed clear, it's really good to get a solicitor involved. I think if you if you can, and just make sure you you read it and understand every part of of, of that contract. Yeah, Casper, would you echo that? Yeah, I mean, I hundred percent agree with all of that. I think that you know, making sure you really do understand it is so critical. I mean, you know, I remember when I was starting out with Wish, and I was talking to another friend of mine who had a dev studio, and he. Uh, he asked, we were talking about the deal that we've been offered and and he asked me about appointment. I said, yeah, I, th I think that's what it means. And he, said, and he was quite hard with me. He said, don't think, <laughs> you need to know. You need yeah. to know what that says. Don't guess at it. And it's worth you spending the money to be sure. And, and actually what I found as well, working with Sony uh, was that they, if we asked them about things, either the development producers, the senior guys that did a lot of the contract stuff, or the legal team were actually quite happy to help us and explain some of the stuff to us. You know, mm. it wasn't like they saw it as like a, a problem in the negotiation or anything. They just saw it as mm. like they're doing deals all the time and you're doing like one deal every couple of years. So mm. they're going to be more expert in it, but that doesn't mean that you should roll over on every point. It just means you need to understand what it's about. Yeah. yeah, I suppose like you, you do need somebody fighting your corner. So if there's something that they feel that there should be in the contract, like, I don't know, um, sequel rights or something like that, then you need somebody to, to kind of fight fight in your corner, really. Is that, I mean, that's what solicitors do in that situation. Yeah, yeah, if you get a good one. I mean, it's I've likened it before to when I've worked with some voice actors and, you know, you have like the creative conversation with the voice actor and and work out what you want to do for the role of the character they're going to voice and all that kind of stuff. But then when it comes to actually the deal and the money, it's all with their agent, right? You'd never mm. have that conversation with the voice actor. And so it's kind of like, should be like that with your solicitor if you have a good one. You know, you might talk about some of it yourself inevitably, but mm. really, you know, you want them to be there to have some of the harder conversations if you need them to. Yeah. And obviously, uh, Dave, from your side, um, when you've oh, dealt I with, feel like I, I'm the evil one in a month. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. No, I think I think uh, I think the what's been great. I think over the last, you know, since I joined Gear in Public, is that um, you know the the, the you know I, I heard tales of you know in the '90s and early 2000s of you know of of, of developers. Um, not getting money from from some less reputable publishers, but I think that things have have, have changed quite considerably, and I think that well, now well, publishers are much more looked at as partners with the developer, and you know it's much much more of a kind of um, an equal uh, relationship. It seems. Yeah, but, but I, uh, listen, I mean, I, I I wholeheartedly agree with everything that's been said, and and you know I think if you. Uh, at, at any stage in the whole process of, of bringing games to the market or wherever you sit, it's basic commercial common sense. If you're mm. entering into a contract, you need to understand what the contract, the contract says. And, and certainly from when I headed up Green Man Gaming, one of the things that I'd say to all the developers is that, look, now's your chance to ask a question because the minute the ink dries, there's no going back. You can mow, mm. you can bitch, you can do whatever, but you signed it. So go away and make sure you understand it. Right? 
there was there's always the the, the grey area whereby you know a solicitor um, will um, go you know they they, they 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 charge by the hour, uh, and they will try and make problems where there really aren't problems. So you have to be mindful of that. And you you know you've got to use your common sense, but for God's sake, yes, get a you know get good legal advice because that will be your guiding document for however long the the period of the contract is mm. but i think there's more to it than that if i could add on top of all of that the the thing that i mean i've done quite a lot of these um you know uh, speed dating type meet the developer type things and you know the whole question is is yeah you know, that i always get i did i did one last week with falmouth university and they've got a whole load of, uh, of degree courses down there. And without exception, the number one question I was asked by all the students there, do I need a publisher? And the answer to, to, to that is, well, most of the time, yes, but not all the time. Self-publishing, you know, is, is, is quite feasible, even on low budget and sometimes preferable particularly if you're operating in a, in, a, in a very niche area that, that you know, you understand and, and maybe a, a publisher wouldn't. And, and maybe an extreme example I'd give is some of these, you know, maybe the Games Workshop type licenses, you know, the tabletop mm. gaming, which is kind of like, oh my God, you know, it's, 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 it's crazy stuff. And, and for that, you really do need to know your audience. And, and, that, and, and examples like that, it can help. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then, but what a publisher does is two things, is in, in, in my opinion. One is reduce risk, and the other for you as a developer, and the other is maximize your revenues. Right? And that's the way I look at it. And so, you know, so, so that's why I try, you know, personally, I recommend going down the publisher route. And, and but when dealing with publishers, is that, you know, they're, they're, yes, it's a far better world than perhaps it once was. But trust me when I say there are publishers and there are publishers. Uh, and, you know, you, you've got you've to see, it's a bit like the analogy I always use, it's like buying a house. Right? You go out there and the more houses you'll see, you know when you're, gonna, you know when you're getting ripped off price-wise. You, know, you end up getting a good gut feel when, you know, um, you know the, the, the deal's good, the, the publisher looks good, you know, and, they, and they, they kind of all sit in. So, so do your homework. As much as a publisher will do their homework on you, you do your homework on a publisher and make sure that they're right fit. And then I think it was Victoria was saying at right at the beginning of this about the importance of a personal relationship. Uh, at the end of the day, you've got to work with a publisher for one, two, three, four, five years however long that contract, that piece of paper says. And, and if you fall out after the first six months, it's gonna be a fairly crappy relationship and a mm. horrific time. So, so there's gotta be a connection as well. So, mm. you know, so there are, yes, there's, of course there's all the legal stuff, but actually there's more as well on top of that. So, mm. so make sure, if, so if you're bringing a game to market and it's due out in 18 months time, start looking at developers now today mm, mm. yeah um, oh, sorry, publishers i meant not developers yeah sorry. publishers today. yeah today um cool um we're sort of approaching um the end of um the panel really but um i just want to ask uh ask you all actually um what sort of what's the most, kind of single most important piece of advice you would give to anyone running a games business and i suppose it can count like at the moment as well uh, during this current situation, you know, what advice, the single most important bit of advice you would give to games companies at this particular time? Casper, well, do you want to go first? <laughs> or Vic? <laughs> yeah. Do, do, you know, bolt, do you know what? The best the piece of advice I was ever given for the, in the video games industry was from a guy called Mike Sherlock, who's sadly no longer with us, uh, ex uh, COO of uh, Sega. And he said to me, the only way to make a million in the video games industry is to start with two. And I've stuck with that ever since. <laughs> so, so that's my advice. Start with two. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, 
Yeah, Vic, or, or I, well, I think um, I, I don't know if it's particular to this time, but I would just say, just remember, you can't do it all by yourself. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's mm. that's kind of how I've always, you know, thought. It's you, you can only do so much. You do have to delegate. You do have to trust people. You do have to value people. It's all about people. So. Don't try and do it all by yourself because it's the way to going prematurely grey. And you know, <laughs> although <laughs> I've, I've experienced that, but you know, you, you you've got to you've got to trust other people, and you, you don't think you can do it all. You're the best at it. I, you know, I, I can do that. I'm going to do it myself. You know, I'll just do it because Timmy have the time. You've got to forget all that. You've got to remember you can't do it without a team. So that, I think that's my most important advice. And, and guess it holds true in, in these times as well. Even though yeah. we, we are not allowed to be together, you still got to work out how you're going to work with that team and, and work with people and keep those relationships going. Yeah. No, it's good. Yeah. Cass, what would you, uh, would you add anything to that? Uh, yeah, I've got two quick ones. One is I think on the business side, um, new business development is an absolutely constant part of the business it has to be yeah. and uh, never forget that right in terms of just coming up with ideas keeping contacts getting yourself out there talking to people you know that is absolutely critical to success and then the personal one that i'd end on is that uh, when i got married someone said to me uh, that you're gonna have a really intense busy day and just make sure you take time to stop and like look around and enjoy it and actually enjoy this moment of getting married because mm. it'll be gone before you know it the day it'll shoot past and running a game studio is kind of like that feeling right it's so busy you're so non-stop with it really just i say to everyone just make sure you just take a moment and actually enjoy what you're doing and enjoy what you've created and you know because it'll it can as i found out it's gone before you know it sometimes yeah yeah, yeah. True. No, so true and uh, yeah very good advice and uh, thank you thank you to our our panelists uh, that's dave casper uh, and uh, vic that's that's brilliant thank you very much uh, really useful stuff there um so um yeah thank you again to anna as well um who's who's been with us today yeah there she is <laughs> uh, fantastic um our next event uh, is in two weeks on uh, Thursday, the 25th of June, uh, the first of our new um, Game Republic uh, studio specials. And we've got Team 17 lined up, which I'm really excited about. Um, something that we've been talking about with them uh, since the beginning of this year, actually. And we were wanting to do um, actual physical studio visits, which we, we unfortunately can't do at the moment. But uh, uh, this is going to be a really exciting online event anyway uh, with Team 17. We've got an introduction, um, first of all, from uh, Debbie Bestwick, uh, CEO. And then we'll hear from various uh, Team 17 uh, Teamsters about uh, games development, uh, publishing and more. And it's just um, a really good opportunity to get the inside story on uh, one of our longest running and most successful uh, studios uh, and a chance to ask uh, questions and learn more about their business as well, which is I'm really excited about. So that's at four o'clock uh, in two weeks time on Thursday, the 25th of June. Um, tonight uh, is PlayStation 5 at nine o'clock. So um, tune in for that and see what exciting stuff is happening uh, in this, uh, which would have been, I think, E3 week. So um, a big thanks again uh, to our sponsor Barclays and uh, to everyone here for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you for um, being part of Game Republic. Um, really appreciate all the all support, uh, continued support you're giving Game Republic and um, I'll keep running these events and helping you. So if you've got any other questions or follow-ups and things and if you want to get in contact with Casper, Victoria or, or David, um, just please email me uh, or Anna indeed um, and I can give you the email addresses. So um, that's it. Uh, you're all brilliant. Uh, stay safe mm -hmm. and uh, Thanks, we'll see you soon. Good to see you guys. See everyone. Take care. Bye. Yeah, take care. Bye. Bye.